She was one of the old guard of revolutionary America. Her works, whether satirical plays like The Adulator or The Group or her three-volume chronicle of the American Revolution, History of the Rise, Progress, and Termination of the American Revolution, laid the cornerstone of early American political thought before, during, and after the American War of Independence. She was a confidant and friend to people across the ideological divide, befriending Abigail and John Adams, George and Martha Washington, Samuel Adams, Patrick Henry, and Thomas Jefferson. She was one of the few women who could publish her works openly in a world dominated by men doing so for the first time in 1790. Yet she also believed, despite being well-educated, that women must remain in appointed subordination to men for the sake of social order. As her biographer, Rosemary Zagari, puts it in A Woman's Dilemma, Mercy Otis Warren and the American Revolution, her life thus demonstrates how an exceptional woman could manipulate existing gender roles with great success, but also how constricting those roles could ultimately be. Warren's struggle, then, represented not just a battle against Great Britain, but a struggle against the limits of womanhood itself. Today, then, we will dive into Warren's struggle not just against the British Empire, but against the times in which she lived. Welcome to America's Forgotten Founders, where we will look at people whose contributions to the American Revolution, whether on the battlefield, in the halls of power, or on the home front, have been all but forgotten by the annals of history. Just one thing before we start, a lot of the men in Mercy's life were named James, her father, brother, and husband. All of these men would profoundly impact and make possible her career as a writer. For simplicity's sake, her father will always be referred to here as James Sr., her brother as James Jr., and her husband simply as James. All right, let's go. Mercy Otis Warren was born sometime in September 1728, the third of 13 children to Colonel James Otis Sr. and Mary Otis in Barnstable, Massachusetts. She was born into a wealthy and prestigious family. Her mother had roots dating back to the Mayflower, and her father was elected to the Massachusetts House of Representatives in 1745. By 1748, James Otis Sr. was the Attorney General of Massachusetts and a colonel in the state militia. Although women were typically prevented from obtaining a good education, Mercy was tutored alongside her brothers, Joseph and James Jr., by the Reverend Jonathan Russell at her father's insistence. Reverend Russell, it turned out, was also deeply committed to his niece's education. He gave her unlimited access to his personal library. Mercy would devour books on all manners of topics, from ancient Greece and Rome to Elizabethan England. During these years, she developed a love for history that greatly influenced her later literary style. She was viewed by her brothers, as well as Reverend Russell, as an intellectual equal, a revolutionary sentiment for that time. But revolutionary ideals were nothing new to the Otis family. Her father and brother, James Jr., would be at the forefront of the American Revolution. In 1761, James Jr. argued against the rights of assistance that enabled the authorities of Massachusetts to enter any home with no advance notice, no probable cause, and no reason given. Around the same time, James Sr. would begin publicly deriding excessive British policies and severely criticizing Governor Thomas Hutchinson. However, this was done as much out of personal animosity and jealousy as it was out of revolutionary fervor. Hutchinson had been appointed Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court in 1761. In 1774, as the presiding judge of the Barnstable County Court of Common Pleas, the elderly and sickly man struck down Parliament's intolerable acts, ensuring that the county would not enforce the legislation. In this world of revolutionary, anti-British sentiment, Mercy would grow up reading, observing, and often actively participating in political discussion. 
but despite these freedoms, her childhood was harsh. Her family, while perhaps revolutionary in many respects, certainly was not in others. Her parents were devout Puritans that more often expressed their love in the form of discipline rather than affection. Sparing the rod, they feared, might spoil the child. This method left many scars. Furthermore, as the eldest daughter, Mercy helped her mother manage the household and raise her siblings. She also learned to spin and weave. Her formative years, then, were a rather odd blend of gender-breaking and gender-conforming activities in a world where gender roles were generally far more rigid than they are today. After a nine-year courtship, Mercy would marry her brother's friend, the wealthy and politically well-connected James Warren, on November 14, 1754. The couple would have five sons, all of whom would survive to adulthood, though only two would outlive their parents. Though James sometimes had his reservations about Mercy's political and literary pursuits, he was unwaveringly supportive of her throughout his life. In return, she was ever loyal in her support of his own political and military aspirations. For the better part of a decade, from 1755 to 1765, the Warrens lived a relatively quiet life as a wealthy, newlywed couple in rural Massachusetts. They'd have all their children by 1766, as James slowly climbed the political ladder, eventually being elected to the Massachusetts House of Representatives in 1765. By then, the Warren home had become a meeting place for early revolutionary activity, as discontent brewed among the colonists. Mercy, as the hostess, was no doubt aware of the discussions, though it's unlikely she participated directly at this time. It was also about this time that she began her literary career, writing her first poem in 1759 and continuing to write in her spare time between being a mother, wife, and hostess. While Mercy and James were beginning their foray into political life, her brother, James Jr., was at the height of his power as one of the most vocal critics of British policies, writing no less than four pamphlets between 1764 and 1765. But he, like Mercy, her husband, and other early revolutionaries, had no intention of separating from Great Britain. For Mercy, though, this changed on October 1st, 1768, when British troops marched into Boston. She now believed peaceful reconciliation with Great Britain was impossible. The troops represented nothing more than the most ready engine in the hands of despotism. Slowly, more and more of her fellow revolutionaries began drifting toward similar thoughts. As events continued to escalate, a series of unexpected circumstances would catapult Mercy into the limelight, albeit behind the scenes. As the conflict between the British and their subjects escalated, James Jr. and James Sr. were suddenly and unexpectedly forced to withdraw from public life. After being beaten by a British tax official in September 1769, James Jr., who already had begun exhibiting erratic behavior, rapidly declined. By 1771, he was, according to John Adams, raving mad, raving against father, wife, brother, sister, and friend. He could no longer speak coherently, let alone function as the figurehead of the early revolutionary movement. James Sr., on the other hand, was elderly and in poor health. As these two titans of the early revolution fell, Mercy ascended to take their place. She began corresponding, in place of her brother, to the British historian Catherine Macaulay. The energetic and unapologetic Macaulay, the only professional female historian in Great Britain at the time, inspired Mercy to continue her literary and political career. Strengthened by her desire to continue her family's legacy, as well as being emboldened and encouraged by Macaulay, she began publishing her political works, albeit anonymously. The first of these, The Adulator, was an attack on Hutchinson, 
The play details the conflict between Rapatio, a stand-in for Hutchinson, the dictatorial leader of the Kingdom of Servia who seeks to enslave his people, and the freedom-loving Brutus, a stand-in for James Jr., who fights against Rapatio. An excerpt from the play barely disguises the parallels between Great Britain and the Kingdom of Servia. Of Servia's virtuous sons, whose latest breath shall execrate a wretch who dare enslave a generous, free, and independent people, if ye powers divine, ye mark the movements of this nether world, and bring them to account. Crush, crush these vipers. Warren also foreshadowed the violent conflict that would arise if Rapatio did not relent in his tyranny. Murders, blood, and carnage shall crimson all these streets. The play, which was not intended to be a political treatise, learned pamphlet, or scholarly discourse, but was supposed to entertain members of her audience as well as instruct them, was published three years before the first blood was spilled at Lexington and Concord. She followed the adulator with a sequel, The Defeat, a year later in 1773. The Defeat plays on the scandalous hutchinson Watley letters, private correspondence between Hutchinson and British official Thomas Watley, in which Hutchinson voiced his displeasure about colonial resistance to British policies, writing that an abridgment of what is called English liberty may be required if Great Britain was to maintain its hold over the colonies, having a righteous senator declare that Rapatio deserves to be overthrown. Go tell thy master he deceives no more. The covered sting, the half-disguised plan, peeps through the veil and shows the abject man who, for a place, a grasp of shining earth, has stabbed the vitals that first gave him birth. The play played a major role in the ultimate downfall of Hutchinson as governor. At the insistence of John Adams, Mercy published a poem in support of the Boston Tea Party. To give you a sense of its contents, I will read two stanzas. The heroes of the Tuscarora tribe, who scorn alike a fetter or a bribe, in order ranged and wait in freedom's nod to make an offering to the watery god. The fair Salacia victory, victory sings, in spite of heroes, demigods, and kings. She bids defiance to the servile train, the pimps and sycophants of George's reign. That might be a bit difficult to understand, as the poem is deeply rooted in Roman mythology. We'll break down the stanzas. The first stanza praises the Sons of Liberty, who disguised themselves as Indians for sacrificing the British tea to Neptune, the Roman god of the sea. They embrace their freedom of action while refusing to bow to the British authorities, refusing to be bribed into acceptance, and remaining defiant in the face of possible punishment. The second stanza again cements the sacrifice of the tea in defiance of the profiteers and minions of George III's reign. It also paints the Sons of Liberty, who threw the tea overboard, as both heroes and demigods. Many heroes in Roman mythology were the offspring of a god or goddess and a human. In a way, it establishes the Sons of Liberty as heroes in the American pantheon. She also includes a stanza about the power and influence women wield in political affairs. For females have their influence over kings, nor wives nor mistresses were useless things. In aid to the gods of ancient Homer's page, nor when in weighty matters they engage, could they neglect the sex's sage advice. Adams was stunned by the poem, calling it one of the most incontestable evidences of real genius which has yet been exhibited. Adams quickly became one of Mercy's most ardent supporters, strongly encouraging her to continue writing. At this time, Mercy began coming into her own, becoming a confidant and unofficial advisor to many influential patriots, including John and Abigail Adams, Samuel Adams, Patrick Henry, 
and George and Martha Washington. She was able to do so for two main reasons. She had her family's legacy to draw on, and perhaps most importantly, they all knew she was the author of The Adulator and The Defeat. These works attested to her intellect, cunning, and literary prowess. While continuing to raise her family and correspond with the leading figures of the American Revolution and their wives, she continued publishing her work. In 1775, she published The Group, which centered around the British government's revocation of Massachusetts' right to govern itself. The piece is effectively a call to arms. In one passage, a British official, ingloriously named Dupe, lamented Great Britain's treatment of their American subjects while simultaneously praising the righteousness of the American cause. Their valor is great, and justice holds the scale. They fight for freedom, while we stab the breast of every man who is her true professed. They fight in virtue's ever-sacred cause, while we tread on divine and human laws. Glory and victory and lasting fame will crown their arms and bless each hero's name. This masterful piece of satire was effective propaganda. By having the protagonist, Dupe, proclaim that Britain was treading on divine and human laws, she appealed to both religious and secular audiences and encouraged all the people of the colonies to unite together against the British. The group is the last work we know for sure was written by Mercy. Two later works, The Blockheads or The Affrighted Officers, a farce, 1776, and the Motley Assembly, a farce, 1779, are often attributed to her, but most modern scholars disagree. This is due to several stylistic differences between the works, the lack of a female character in either, and the fact Mercy never publicly claimed authorship for them, even later in life. Despite all her success, Mercy continued to be self-conscious of her work, in a letter to Hannah Winthrop, she wrote, I am sensible the world is already full of elegant productions that entertain the imagination and refine the taste. I would not willingly make an addition the last useless class and despairing of eminence in the first. I rather choose my manuscripts should be in the cabinets of my friends to be perused when nothing more instructive or entertaining may offer. Despite her hesitations, however, Mercy would never put down her pen. Mercy's observations on the new Constitution, published anonymously under the pseudonym A Columbia Patriot in early 1788, was her next major work. The pamphlet offered a passionate commentary on the proposed Constitution. As the new nation began to debate the merits of ratification, Mercy wrote with vigor and acerbity against the document. Styling herself as an old Republican, she argued that the style of government proposed by the new Constitution was no different than the oppressive British government the colonies had just fought a war to free themselves from. She believed the new American government could quickly become just as oppressive as the British one had been, if not more so. Animated with the firmest zeal for the interest of this country, the peace and union of the American states, and the freedom and happiness of a people who have made the most costly sacrifices in the cause of liberty, who have braved the power of Britain, weathered the convulsions of war, and waded through the blood of friends and foes to establish their independence and to support the freedom of the human mind, I cannot silently witness this degradation without calling on them before they are compelled to blush at their own servitude and to turn back their languid eyes on their lost liberties to consider that the character of nations generally changes at the moment of revolution. Though the Constitution would come to pass, the Bill of Rights it included was partly inspired by her influential critique. In 1790, she finally published a work again under her own name, Poems, Dramatic and Miscellaneous. 
She also sought and achieved recognition for her earlier works that were published during the American Revolution. Despite being in ill health, contending with the death of her son Winslow at Sinclair's defeat, and a strained marriage with James, Mercy continued writing, eventually finishing her magnum opus, History of the Rise, Progress, and Termination of the American Revolution in 1805. The three-volume set was undoubtedly her greatest achievement. It was a monumental work in early American literature, detailing the events leading up to, during, and after the American Revolution. Totaling 1,298 pages, it took Mercy over 30 years to complete. She had begun working on the book in 1775 at the behest of John Adams. She worked tirelessly, incorporating official documents supplied to her by Thomas Jefferson from the Continental Congress, as well as her personal observations, those of friends, and those of others from newspapers and other literature. Despite being a milestone in American literature, the book sold poorly, so much so that Mercy herself said she suffered from author side. In the book, she does not address the military aspects of the conflict, instead focusing on the social and political transformations of the new nation. She also took a chance to blast John Adams, with whom she had become estranged after the war due to their radically different political ideologies. Adams was implicated by a large portion of his countrymen as having relinquished the Republican system and forgotten the principles of the American Revolution, discovering a partiality in favor of monarchic government. The two would develop a personal hatred until finally reconciling in 1812, shortly before Mercy's death. It was this rift that caused Adams to famously write to a friend History is not the province of the ladies. Mercy Otis Warren never published another work. She died on October 19, 1814, at the age of 86. She was buried at Burial Hill in Plymouth, Massachusetts, not too far from where she and James lived. Mercy's life is a paradox. She was a woman who could stand on her own merits, yet was afraid always to overstep herself. She rose above the constraints of her day, but we need to remember that she could never have done so without powerful male benefactors. Throughout her life, powerful and influential men, her father, James Sr., brother, James Jr., John Adams, and her husband actively supported and encouraged her in her intellectual and literary pursuits. While most women had no supporters, Mercy Warren had several, as we saw, that support, though, could come and go. When James Warren began harboring doubts about Mercy's literary career, John Adams would write to him that he ought to tell his wife that God Almighty has entrusted her with the powers for the good of the world, which, in the cause of his providence, he bestows on few of the human race, that instead of being a fault to use them, it would be criminal to neglect them. Years later, it would be the same Adams that would challenge her authority as a historian simply because she was a woman. Through her life, as well as her works, we gain an insightful and invaluable perspective of the American Revolution through the eyes of one of the earliest female authors in American history. I hope you found this video both informative and exciting. Make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. And join us next time as we look at our next forgotten figure, the penman of the Constitution, and Robert Morris's Deputy Superintendent of Finance, Governor Morris.